area, it's also important to consider the weaknesses in China's maritime strategy. Indeed, it is argued that provided the U.S. and its allies and partners invest a small counter, invest in smart counter strategies, China will find it very difficult to overcome its maritime dilemmas and to coerce regional countries in accepting Beijing's territorial claims. First, the Taiwan dilemma. Let's start with China's Taiwan dilemma. The conventional wisdom is that China has already succeeded in its A280 strategy in the Taiwan Straits by raising the cost for third-party intervention and making it prohibitively high. That is keeping U.S. carrier battle groups at arm's length. But even if the PLA manages to keep U.S. forces out of a conflict through a sea denial strategy, which in itself is a very risky assumption given the importance of Taiwan in U.S. Pacific strategy, it faces serious political and operational challenges in invading Taiwan. As argued elsewhere, Taiwan is systematically investing in its own sea denial strategy and the PLA would need to physically destroy most of the island's infrastructure prior to invasion with disastrous consequences for China's international and regional reputation. In short, the PLAN's A2 AD approach in the Taiwan Strait might not translate into real political currency for Beijing's leadership. Secondly, U.S. naval strategists argue that the PLAN faces a strategic choke point dilemma. I repeat, a strategic choke point dilemma. The moment the PLAN <coughs> sails to the Taiwan Straits into the wider Western Pacific Ocean, it faces the combined naval power of the U.S. Navy and her allies, particularly Japan. It couldn't hope to establish a significant level of sea control in this area. Moreover, as soon as the PLAN projects maritime power out of Hainan Island into the South China Sea to assert its claims in the Nine Dust Line, it will face a re-engaged U.S. military as well as A280 pockets of Southeast Asian countries. Just like the U.S. Navy and other modern navies, the PLAN won't be immune from sea denial capabilities such as submarines, anti-submarine warfare, and anti-ship missiles. Moreover, the Chinese government has pointed to the country's Malacca dilemma, the PLAN's inability to protect China's energy transport in this strategic choke point. But given the geostrategic characteristics of the Malacca Strait, only 1.5 nautical miles at its narrowest point and critical not just for China, but the rest of Asia. Military options for China are also very limited. Any attempt to project naval power to control this area will automatically draw China into conflict with regional heavyweights such as India, Indonesia, and Japan. Hardly a winning formula. This is the illustration of the strategic choke point China surrounded by many countries. The Malacca Strait dilemma. Most of its uh, seaborne trade will have to pass to the Malacca and it can be easily interdicted there. Finally, Chinese strategists seem to be aware that the offensive use of naval power against its Asian neighbors will most likely not achieve any political objective. The opportunity costs of a war at sea are just too high. That's probably why the most significant recent development in China's maritime strategy has been the creation of a unified Coast Guard agency, civilian. This step potentially strengthens China's capacity to use non-military vessels for coercive purposes in territorial disputes with Japan and Southeast Asian nations. But even this strategy has limits. Regional countries are upgrading their Coast Guards and other maritime agencies to level the playing field. They also cooperate, as in the case of Japan and the Philippines. In July, Tokyo announced it would provide Manila with 10 Coast Guard patrol boats through a yen loan to help it to counter Beijing's maritime assertiveness. Regional countries are also increasing their maritime surveillance capabilities to monitor and expose Chinese maritime behavior to a domestic, regional, and global audience. This fundamentally undermines Beijing's attempt to restore its soft power deficit accumulated over recent years. While China's naval power projection will certainly grow in the future, 
it's far from inevitable that the PLAN's coercive potential will increase commensurately. Indeed, the PLAN's care desire for big surface combatants and aircraft carriers runs counter to modern Navy's recognition that the future lies in a greater number of smaller, more dispersed, and less vulnerable ships which operate as part of a joint force. And the study continues, they're not convinced that China as a continental power has much to gain politically by investing in a very expansive, offensive blue water navy. And even if it does, the good news is that there will be a lot of ways to upset the PLAN or China strategy. PLA Navy getting bigger, but can it break out? I'm showing you the, the various, uh, the North Sea fleet base, the East and South uh, fleet base, and you can see that they can be easily interdicted because they operate in very restricted waters, unlike the other maritime powers like India, uh, Japan, the United States, and potentially the Philippines, and including Indonesia. And probably that's the reason why China's president said, let's set aside sea disputes for development. China has triggered a coalition against itself. I'd like to show you the recent ranking of the world's military powers based on the world's armed forces forum. Number one, United States. A distant second, China. There's France. Number four is Russia, which is also a Pacific power. Number six is Japan. Number nine is India. Number 11 is South Korea. 16 is Canada, which is also a Pacific power. In fact, Canada is planning to transfer some of its naval assets to the Pacific area. 19 is Australia. And number 24 is Singapore. And you will note that China is almost alone in this uh, lineup. Maybe Russia can be an ally. The most significant development is the U.S. is strategic pivot to the Asia-Pacific area. And here's a breakdown of U.S. troop deployment under their rebalancing policy. In South Korea, 28,500 troops. In Japan, 50,000. In Vietnam, around 20, but they seek to build a stronger military partnership. In Guam, 5,400 troops with an addition of about 5,000 drone from Japan. In the Philippines, around 140 with expanded rotational deployment agreements. In Australia, around 350, but in Darwin, rotational deployment of up to 2,500 Marines drawn globally. In Perth, the U.S. is seeking greater access to the Australian naval base. In Singapore, around 150 and an agreement on stationing for littoral combat ships, or LCS. In fact, there's one there now, the USS Freedom. And in Thailand, around 120, and they have signed a joint vision statement for stronger military ties. May I quote some excerpts from the U.S. Congressional Research Study entitled People to the Pacific, the Obama Administration's Rebalancing Toward Asia. The U.S. increased emphasis in the Asia-Pacific region appears to have been prompted by four major developments. Number one, the growing economic importance of the Asia-Pacific region and particularly China to the U.S. economic future. Number two, China's growing military capabilities and its increasing assertiveness of claims in disputed maritime territory with implications for freedom of navigation and the U.S. ability to project power in the region. Number four, the winding down of U.S. military operation in Iraq and Afghanistan. And number four, efforts to cut the U.S. federal government's budget, particularly the defense budget, which threatened to create a perception in Asia that the U.S. commitment to the region will wane. Adjustments in U.S. security policy. The highest profile new initiatives lie in the security sphere. The planned deployments of troops and equipment to Australia and Singapore represent an expanded U.S. presence. Moreover, the plans that reductions in defense spending will not come at the expense of the Asia-Pacific or the Middle East signals administration's desire to reorient the Department of Defense priorities. The most obvious implication subsequently reflected in their DOD guideline guidance has been to minimize cuts in the size of the Navy, with reductions focused instead on Army and Marine ground forces. With the exception of the Korean Peninsula, 
Asia is seen mainly as a naval theater of operation, and the decision not to cut the Navy as sharply as other services reflects the shift in priorities that is unusual in year-to-year -year defense planning. The Defense Department is complementing these changes with perhaps equal, equally far-reaching shifts in military technological priorities in the U.S. defense posture. A number of initiatives are relevant to assessments of potential challenges in Asia in general and from China in particular. Among other things, the Defense Department strategy review endorsed the continued deployment of 11 aircraft carriers and the emphasized efforts to improve capabilities to defeat what planners describe as area denial anti-access strategies which are also known to be a focus for China's military. The rising importance of the Asia-Pacific underlying the pivot is the administration's belief that the center of gravity for U.S. foreign policy, national security, and economic interest is shifting towards Asia, and that U.S. strategy and priorities need to be adjusted accordingly. Since 2000, Asia has become the U.S. largest source of imports and second largest export market after North America. As the world's most populous area and fastest growing economic zone, Asia is expected to become even more vital for the U.S. economy in the future, an expectation that has led to the Obama administration's Trans-Pacific Partnership and to make Asian nations central to its national export initiative. Greater trade flows to the Asia Pacific, particularly the Strait of Malacca and South China Sea, have also reinforced greater U.S. security interests in the region, as have the major expansion of their local nations' military forces, most notably China. I'd like to show you an appendix on the economic rise of Asia during the past 30 years. From 1980 to 2010, for exports to the U.S. as an export uh, destination, Africa declined from 6% to 3.3%. Europe declined from 44% to 37%. North America declined from 15% to 12.9%. But Asia, including China, increased dramatically from 15.9% to 33.3%. As imports uh, area, Africa declined from 4.7 to 3 percent. Europe declined from 48 percent to 37 percent. North America steady from 16.5 to 17.4 percent. But Asia, including China, from 16.9 percent to a dramatic rise to 31.4 percent. U.S. deploying jets around Asia to keep China surrounded. The United States Air Force will dramatically expand its military presence across the Pacific this year, sending jets to Thailand, India, Singapore, and Australia, according to the service's top general in the region. In Australia, for example, the Air Force will dispatch fighters, tankers, and at some point in the future, maybe bombers on a rotational basis, according to General Herbert Carlyle, Chief of the U.S. Air Force Operations in the Pacific. Pentagon Chief to stress U.S. pivot in Southeast Asia tour. U.S. Defense uh, Secretary Chuck uh, Hagel kicked off a Southeast Asia tour meant to stress Washington's so-called pivot back towards Asia Pacific. Surrounded how the U.S. how the U.S. is encircling China with military bases is headline in the FP National Security. The U.S. military is encircling China with a chain of air bases and military ports. The latest link is a small airstrip on the tiny Pacific island of Saipan. The U.S. Air Force is planning to lease 33 acres of land on the island for the next 50 years to build a divert airfield of an old World War II air base there. The Pentagon's big new strategy for the, first, for the 21st century is something called air-sea battle, a concept that's nominally about combining air and naval forces to pass through the increasingly formidable defenses of nations like China or even Iran. An important but oft overlooked part of air-sea battle calls for the military to operate from small, bare-bones bases in the Pacific that its forces can disperse to in case their main bases are targeted by Chinese ballistic missiles. Russia 
reminded the world that it is a pacific